The river. To us today, it means commerce and trade, employment and economic vitality. The river has served this region like a lifeline, a natural waterway to the nation, providing an essential link to markets for industries such as agriculture, mining, utilities, and transportation. Rich in tradition and folklore, the river is nurturing and life-sustaining. The first settlers arrived in this area around 900 AD and established a thriving river culture. Nearly every spring, flooding comes to the upper Mississippi River Valley. The headwaters of the Mississippi send a cascade of melting ice and snow southward. It's a fact of life for people who choose to live and work in floodplains. However, 1993 was different. The spring flooding came all right, but the rain never stopped. All summer long, thunderstorms pounded the upper Midwest, sending record-setting volumes of water crashing downriver against the protective levee system. By the time the river flowed back in its banks, nearly four months out of our lives were missing, swept downstream with our homes and our livelihood. The swollen rivers crippled barge traffic and swamped arteries essential to the trucking and railroad industries. Four months critical to area farmers were also washed away, along with the mud and debris. For families and businesses living and working up and down the Mississippi River Valley, 1993 will always be remembered as the summer that never was. If you happen to live in the path of the Great Flood of 93, you can throw all the numbers out the window. The sight of your farm disappearing in the wake of an overtop levee was all the proof you needed or wanted of the river's destructive fury. And yet during the summer of 1993, throughout the upper Midwest, the numbers help us put it all in focus. More than 15,600 square miles of land underwater 55,000 homes damaged or destroyed, $15 billion in damages, $2.5 billion in soybean and corn loss alone, and 50 people lost their lives. At 10 a.m. on August 1st, the Great Flood reached its record crest of 49.58 feet. At that time, 1,080,000 cubic feet of water, that's 8.1 million gallons of water per second, flowed past the legs of the Gateway Arch. The Great Flood of 1993 was relentless. Yet without the intervention and expertise of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, local levy commissioners, area residents, and dedicated tireless volunteers, the situation could have been measured in catastrophic proportions. Billions of dollars in industry stayed dry and productive behind urban flood protection on the industrial east side. Farmers along the Salt River, shielded by the flood protection of the Mark Twain Reservoir, completed a successful growing season unimpeded by floodwaters. For these reasons and more, this is a story that goes beyond that of a natural disaster. It's a story about the dedication and determination of the Army Corps of Engineers throughout the spring and summer of 1993.
The length and intensity of the flood went well beyond the capacity that most levees were expected to hold. The constant battering forced overtopping, destroyed property, closed the river to transportation and uprooted families and businesses. Predictions of the river's crest seemed to rise on a daily basis. As the Army Corps of Engineers and locals built their levees to withstand one level, another round of rainfall dashed their hopes. Yet through it all, the federal levee system exceeded expectations. More than 80% of them survived the assault. Most of the levees that failed or overtopped were private or non-federal levees. The Great Flood of 93 will go down in history as the flood of record. In some areas, it's been called a 500-year flood. Fed by dozens of swollen rivers, the Mississippi and Missouri were like backed up drains. The water was turned on high and had nowhere to go except over the top. For the St. Louis District of the Army Corps of Engineers, the flood battle began in April at Clarksville, Missouri, on the northern end of the St. Louis District. Heavy snowfall to the north meant certain spring flooding. Though no one knew it at the time, the spring flood would be nothing more than a prelude to the summer disaster that followed. The 50-plus year old Lock and Dam 24 at Clarksville is highly functional even though most of the equipment is obsolete. It was crucial to protect the lock's motors and gears. Using knowledge gained from the 73 flood, lock master Chris Morgan and his crew put up a valiant defense of lock and dam 24. From March 25th until late August, the dam stood in a condition known as open river. Open river conditions means that this place is known as a navigational lock and dam. Navigational lock and dam meaning that we're stair steps of water to give the towing industry a stair step in low water conditions. We're not here for high water, we're strictly low water. As a navigational lock and dam, 24 provides no flood protection. It is not designed to perform that task. However, lock and dam 24's defense, as with other navigational locks and dams, was vital to the barge industry. After absorbing nature's worst hit in recorded history, the crew quickly prepared the locks for reopening to navigation in late August. Almost everywhere you went during the summer, people were asking, what's with this crazy weather? Well, technically what happened is, an area of high pressure in the upper atmosphere stalled out over the eastern United States. What that meant for them was summer drought. But in the Midwest, the high pressure acted like a brick wall, and normal weather patterns were unable to pass through it. As a result, wave after wave of torrential downpours pounded the Midwest. By the end of June, eastern Missouri was already eight inches above normal rainfall. Just as stubborn, though, was the all-out battle to keep people and property dry. Towns like Kimswick, Prairie de Rocher, Hardin, and St. Genevieve stood tall both in victory and defeat. The Illinois River is home to dozens of rural communities. During moderate flooding, towns like Nutwood, Eldred, and Rosedale are protected by their levees. But during the flood, the Illinois was deluged with backflow from the Mississippi. As the Illinois backed up and stayed high for months, the water saturated the levees. Weak spots and sand boils were a constant struggle. Vigilant Corps employees somehow managed to nurse the levees through the danger until the rising water simply became too much and most overtopped. Miraculously, the Keech levee beat the odds and held, despite water levels nearly six feet higher than design. 
Sometimes in the middle of an emotionally charged situation, desperate conditions can lead rational people into irrational yet well-intentioned responses. Such was the case when the Keech levee nearly breached on the morning of August the 3rd. How long did you stand there in human chain form to stop this water? About two and a half to three hours. Two and a half to three hours. And uh, what would happen is half of them were in the chain, and the rest of us were out in the water holding the boats and throwing sandbags to the people, and they were just setting them down in front of them until they got a good base built, and we just started building up from there. The sound of people fighting for their livelihood was a sound that would reverberate all summer long, from Clarksville to Cape Girardeau. Some incredibly brave people, under some incredibly hazardous situations, performed their jobs despite the miserable conditions. Of course, we all remember the amazing satellite photos comparing river levels from 1988 and 1993. But if you look carefully at the photographs, you'll notice some truly remarkable details. For example, if you draw a line along the east side of the Mississippi, from Edwardsville to just south of St. Louis, there is no real difference in the two photos, other than a slight widening of the river. Why? because the east side urban levee system held tight through the duration, protecting thousands of homes and billions of dollars in industry. Successful levee flood fighting efforts were abundant that summer, but broken or overtop levees seemed to make better copy for the news media. The fact that St. Louis's industrial area and the entire east side stayed dry for the duration is ample testimony to the Corps' diligence. Case in point, the St. Louis flood wall. After nearly two months above flood stage, a large leak developed under the northern section of the wall. The leak washed away large amounts of foundation material and caused a 20-foot section of the wall to tilt about four inches toward the river. The flood wall, built to hold back a crest of 52 feet, has stood the test of time and proven its worth many times over. But a failure here would have meant 10 feet of water from the northern city limits down to the arch. The problem at Riverview was actually the result of sewer projects built since the wall's construction that compromised the wall's integrity. On-site troubleshooting and instant response were to be the hallmark of the Corps' flood fighting efforts during the entire summer. The wall up there is a soil-founded wall. Uh, it is uh, sitting on some silty material. It developed very serious under seepage problems. And I think it was on about the 23rd or 24th of July, <clears throat> at about 11 o'clock in the evening, a boil developed behind the wall that seriously endangered the wall and uh, produced a lot of water at that particular time. Guys underground, the uh, Dennis Seibel and, uh, and uh, Joe Schwenk and others on the ground uh, took immediate action to to haul rock in and dump it behind the flood wall where the water was coming up. That cut down on the flow, but we were still concerned uh, about slippage of the wall because we knew a cavity had developed underneath it. Uh, we then recommended that the city build a rock dike, if you will, or closure structure uh, around the land side portion of this area. Once it was stabilized, one of the additional things that happened is uh, we made a recommendation to the city that they grout that cavity. Uh, they uh, agreed with that. They hired a contractor. Holes were drilled on the uh, water side of the wall uh, into this cavity and they then, they then grouted it with uh, approximately 110 cubic yards of material. By midsummer, the magnitude of the flood was beginning to sink in for everyone. 
The situation went beyond the critical stage. People were hurting. The flood crossed the line between major flooding and became a full-fledged crisis. Water levels went far beyond what most levees were designed to hold, and the force of the water continued to pound them day and night for months. The Corps of Engineers described the beginning of August as the weekend from hell. Whether you fought the good fight only to succumb like the town of Hardin, or you hung on and beat the odds like the people of St. Genevieve, win or lose, their defiant struggle in the face of adversity captured the heart of the entire country. Throughout the summer, the Army Corps proved there's more than one way to fight a flood. You can mobilize an army of sandbaggers, build up the levee and gut it out, or sometimes you can buy a little time, go out after the river, fight water with water, and win. Such was the case during the weekend of August the 1st, when the Columbia and Harrisonville levees overtopped. Prairie du Rocher is a historic French fur trading town that sits just south of the Prairie du Rocher levee. Once the levees north of Prairie du Rocher overtopped, the concern was that the onrushing water, now on the wrong side of the levee and heading south, would swamp the levee protecting the town. The Corps devised a bold plan to intentionally breach the levee here at the bottom of the Harrisonville Fort Chartres levee system to allow the water that had broken through further north to drain out down here before it could overtop the Prairie de Rocher levee, which runs east from the river. We had some time to try something in this case where we didn't at Columbia. We had to try to something that would allow it not to jump the next levee and do the same thing with the Prairie de Rocher levee system and wipe out the town of Prairie de Rocher. So we got with the locals that morning and, and we worked out a plan in order to actually try a control breach. But the key to this whole thing is not to get anybody wet before they would have anyway, which is really kind of a, a juggling act. It turned out to be a juggling act that paid big dividends, but not without some tense moments. The location the Corps selected for the planned breach proved to be one of the toughest sections of the levee system. Initially, the rush of water over the top of the breach failed to create additional erosion of the levee. The decision was made to open more holes in the system. Against the advice of the Corps, locals set off explosive charges in an attempt to blow out two more sections of the levee. While this was less than successful in bringing more water, it did soften the levee material, allowing the Corps to excavate deeper, and Mother Nature pitched in by opening up another section of the levee just to the north. And then about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we started to get a slowdown of the rate at which the water was rising, and then it started to drop. So then we knew that our breaches had opened up sufficiently to take care of all the water coming in, was going out the breaches, and we were no longer filling up the district. And that's when we had to breathe a sigh of relief that we stopped the, basically, the domino effect. You know, it's a, it's a small victory, but it, it, it means a lot to us. You know, it, it's really a miracle. I mean, you think about it, the levee was built to a 45, for a 45 flood elevation, and we held 49.5. I mean, it, it's, it should not be there yet today, but it is. St. Genevieve, Missouri is one of the oldest settlements on the Mississippi River. Surely by now, the town's triumphant stand against the driving river has been well documented. Though the people of St. Genevieve have no real levee on the riverfront, they stood boldly behind their makeshift wall of sandbags, gravel, plywood, and plastic.
The great flood of 1993 has finally passed, leaving barren fields, floodplains littered with debris, and a monumental cleanup and rebuilding effort. We can only imagine the devastation this flood could have leveled upon us without the Federal Reservoir and Levee Protection System. In the future, we must exercise care in occupying the flood plain. The Mississippi will undoubtedly flood again, and someday exceed the levels we experienced in 1993. Hopefully, that will not occur for centuries, but it could happen as early as next year. The magnitude of commitment that went into fighting the Great Flood of 1993 stretched the Corps' resources and people to the limit. Yet it stirred in us an unyielding passion to fight and win against a relentless river. This was sort of our war. Uh, you didn't have an enemy out there trying to shoot you, but you had this river that, that kept coming at you. Even a war tends to ebb and flow. You have lull periods, you have periods of intense combat, but that's not true with the river. The river just keeps coming. Eventually, though, the river stops coming, and even if at times it may have seemed as if it would never happen, the river finally crests and the water slowly begins to recede. To those of us who fought through it, who challenged the river's imposing power, who stood tall both in victory and in defeat, the flood will always be etched in our memory as the summer that never was. Music